A very warm welcome to Dame Billy Miller, Her Life in Focus. I'm sure Ruth McCaskey, as always, I'm pleased that you have joined us. This episode begins with a continuation of her father's story. Yes, his attention to detail, his use of the compass to determine where plants were to be planted around the home. We will also learn of her good use of the public library and how they interacted with the environment around the home. He was very precise. He was very precise about things. But um, he had a feel already for the world, what was happening in the world. He paid a lot of attention. When I was growing up, he made subscriptions to, to books and so on. The library was a very important place for me. Every Saturday morning, I would be number one because I wanted to get Enid Blyton book, if there was a new one. And he had this big library, as I said, and I just was a reader. My brothers will tell people all the time, by the time we go home and begging to go, if we could go to a matinee, she's finished reading out all the library books already, which was true, because you could only have two, and they had to have covers. And you're not getting into the library, the broom. Her name was Miss Callender, the junior library upstairs. You had to come in with your, with, your, with your covers. If not, you couldn't take a book out. And you had little tablets, they were called in those days. But it was really a library card. And um, we were all introduced to that. But he was a voracious reader. Got up at 5 o'clock every morning sat down on the veranda. He had used a little compass of a certain kind. And um, he planted a number of interesting trees that he liked in around the house. But he was determined that the veranda that we would be sitting on most of the time, and he would be sitting on every morning, that the sun would never touch it. And so he planted the trees with the compass in his hand. At that time, to make money to, to build that house that we grew up in, he started building houses for other people, like friends, the Zephyrin brothers and, and so on. Um, the, um, what was his name? He was our um, druggist. You know, all your toiletries and so on. On Saturday, they went home from the Hudson's drugstore on um, Milk Market then, and things like that to, to raise the money. And then he named our house Solitude. I mean, <laughs> there was no solitude there. But it was a nice quality of life. We were near the sea. We could walk to it. But my mother never allowed us to go on bank holidays somebody always drowned or came close to drowning there down at Brighton. It was a big long beach went back toward town and um, Brandon, it, it, Brighton ran into Brandon so to speak and um, I only ever in my lifetime encountered one near drowning there. My mother was very ill in the hospital and my eldest brother, Buddy, who lives in Trinidad, we would be so tired because she was at a stage where she had to be lifted and stuff like that. And um, so we would go down on a Saturday evening, you know, like two o'clock, three o'clock. And I don't know if you know about Brighton Beach, but there's said to be something called the Round Table out there. It's a huge rock that you could actually stand on. But it was quite a distance out. And we're sitting on the beach. And a small group of fellows come and um, jumped into the sea and swam out. My brother and I are there just exhausted, sitting on the beach. And then suddenly, I said, where are those boys gone? Where have they gone? 
It was a tall, tall fellow. His parents lived at the bottom of Brighton, near to, very close to the beach. And he was a good swimmer too. And he and Buddy jumped into the sea, swam out. There were three fellows. They brought back two. Had to go back for the third. He was face down in the sand. So he was breathing in sand as well. They brought him. I was a girl guide and, and they became a guider. But the girl guide group that I was in, it was um, Barbados number one. Um, they taught us life saving using the Holger Nielsen method. So you have to put the person lying on the stomach preferably like this, and for um, the grace of God, the beach was on a bit of a slant. And you then put the head on the two hands, you put the two hands here, and then you stand up over, or you kneel, and you then lift the elbows, open up the diaphragm, you go down again, and you can see this sand and water coming out of his mouth, his nose, every orifice. And I'm there and counting, just like I was taught to, by um, Sheila Pilgrim, Daphne Joseph Hackett. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And when I thought my hands were going to fall off, there was an Englishman who was staying at some friends who were living on Brighton Beach. And he came running and he said to me, can I help you? I said, yes, please, I think my hands are going to fall off. And um, he took it over. And, he, and then I started shouting, call the ambulance, stop staring and call the ambulance. You know, Bajans run into a catastrophe. And the ambulance came and took him away. Later that same evening, my brother and I went up to the hospital to see mommy. She was in the hospital at the time. And before I could even get into the room properly, one of the nurses came to me. She said, there's a little old lady. We have her in our room. You know, they have their room with all the things to give injections to do all these things so on. And she's asking for you. He said, do you know her name? She said, no, she didn't say it to me. I couldn't think who this was. So I went, my brother went inside the room to be with mommy and I followed the nurse. And there is this little old lady. She said, you are Miss Miller? I said, yes, I am. She said, I am the grandmother of the boy that you all saved from drumming. I said, can I give you a hug? Poor soul, she was trembling. Just the thought that she, he could have lost her, she said, he's very hard ears. We had Coco and I told him, do not jump in the sea straight away. You eat a heavy lunch, you don't, and that is exactly what he did. Nobody had to tell me that. She was sweet. So I told her, he's okay now though, he's going to be okay. I don't know what his name was, I didn't know much until somebody pointed out to me what his name was. But I, I never got to meet him properly, but she came to say thank you. Um, but apart from that, Brighton was really a quite safe place. The rum refinery was down at the bottom and there was a football field down there at one stage. It was really great for crabbing. Oh yes, um, big crab holes. But we were warned that in the shootings, you know, they had a shooting marsh like down there and we were warned that we were forbidden to go there when that shooting season was on but um 
apart from that, it was a nice place. And we, we grew up literally on that beach. We weren't allowed to go on bank holidays because my mother said, and she was never wrong on these matters, there is going to be somebody drowning or drowned. You can go tomorrow. By tomorrow it's a school day, all right, well, you can go Saturday. But um, life, was, life was beautiful in those days, really beautiful. But then as I was growing um, more and more, I began to piece things together. My mother, like I told you, was a nurse, but she had to retire once she got married. And every now and again, she would meet up with some of her nurse friends in town under the clock of the ideal store. It was not called Cape Shepherd then. It was called the ideal store. And they would talk, you know, and everybody would, oh, this little girl and this and so on and so forth. But Cape Shepherd was like Waterland in those days. Everything you could get in there, rally bicycles, bath pans, Bibles, hymn books. Um, there was even a little counter where you could buy, um, what would it be, have been called in those days, ice cream in a glass, um, like with a milky thing, I forget what, what it was called, and little snacks. Whatever you wanted, you could buy badges if you were a boy scout or a girl guide. Everything could be sold, was, was being sold at the Eileen store. And that was, that was a big thing. My mother told me that when I was very little, she took me with her there one day and um, I disappeared and she panicked. Um, she who always said, do not panic first, panic tomorrow. Um, Apparently I got under the counter and these two sisters were serving the, oh, we found her. <laughs> so in all other visits to Cave Shepherd, she held my hand like a vice so there was no more running under the counter. I mean, it was like fun. But um, school was important very, very important. Homework was very, very important. We all had to be sat around that um, dining table downstairs. Um, and then when my father came home, he would normally come back about seven and he'd be eating his supper. Sometimes the lady who lived in with us, she had to look after us, cooked everything. And um, she might do an egg custard for him, you know, you know, and all eyes would be on it. Are you doing your homework? Yes, Daddy, we're doing our homework. We're looking to see what, because every now and again he would say, all right, come here. One of us would say, come here, open the beak. And he wouldn't have thought full of what it is that he was eating. But um, he taught us so many things so many things. I can't even begin to, to, to enumerate them to you, but um, what life was like in Barbados. He wanted us to see how other people lived. So he did not hesitate to drive into people's um, plantation yards and stuff like that and tell, well, that is where the overseer lives. That is where the, um, the man who is in charge of the plantation lives and so on and so forth. Um, sometimes we would be chased out, um, but that didn't bother him. He would just say, all right, get back in back, pick up and drive off. I had a very, I think a better understanding because I was the eldest. I got to go places with them that the younger ones wouldn't be ready to go yet and wouldn't be interested in going anyhow. But um, our lives were no different than anybody else in Barbados. Every Sunday, you had to get to church 11 o'clock. 
and you had to get up at that bus stop on Black Rock Main Road for half past ten because the buses weren't running as frequently on a Sunday morning. You got off and you walked up James Street and you went to church. We all had our hymn books. My eldest brother, poor fellow, he's, he, to this day, singing was not his strong point and I can remember. Sometimes mummy would have to pat him off on his shoulder and she would say, buddy, darling, don't, don't sing. <laughs> but um, this James Street Sunday School, at one stage, when I was a young teenager, was the biggest Sunday school in all of Bridgetown. 800. You had the Herd com Memorial across the road from the church. Herd was a very important Methodist preacher. In the time when the Methodists, just like the Moravians and other churches were teaching black people, poor people, middle class people, whoever they were, they were teaching them to read and write, do all kinds of things. And um, he had to run and to be brought back. The only woman who is a national hero, Anne Gill, Sarah Anne Gill, her family had money. And I can remember as a child, right next to the church, James Street doesn't have, he did not have a big curtilage. I mean, there was a lot of parking space for cars when there were cars and so on. And she owned the property right next to the church and then the property next to that as well. And uh, she was generous and she gave one of her properties to the church. But they wanted to kill her. And I think there's a book written about it. Forget the name of the man who wrote it. A, a, a very nice man, obviously, a, a Methodist as well. Yes, and he, he's written about Woody, Woody Blackman. Blackman. Yes, and um, all of anything about Methodism, I have it in my library. And that is very treasured. But um, then you had to get to that bus stop. In, when you came up James Street, Tudor Street was northerly, but the other direction you were immediately in something called Met Market. And between the two, across the road, but I would only do this on Saturdays after the library, Subtle Street, Patois Galore, and all of the women from St. Vincent, St. Lucia and so on, plaited things, beautiful things, Oh my goodness, you know, you just, everything was up on the wall, up on the ceiling, because you had very tiny spaces, you know, and you would go in and, you know, and you would hear them with the patois, out of this world. When I was five, my father came home one day and said to my mother, these children are Caribbean children and they do not know the Caribbean. Start to pack a huge trunk. He was going to take us down the islands. And um, we were all excited. I mean, we were tiny. I was, I was then five. And my mother was big and pregnant then. And he put us on a schooner called the Monica. Came right into the outer Karenish there. Nighttime, you were on deck. Only things to sell were below. That was it. You were on deck. So in the dark, you know, all of us now squeezing that to my bee. This is a new experience. First time we're going away now in this long, in this big boat. And the first stop at dawn, we were in St. Lucia. And then the next stop, it was still dark, but you, the dawn was coming on. And my father found a, a, a taxi man, 
And my brother, the one who lives in Trinidad, and always, he's like that. He, anything that's metal and can be made into something, he could do it. And he got his forefinger when the man closed the door. And to this day, that nail is still, you know, crushed. But um, then we stopped at Martinique, and I thought it was so strange. The church was virtually empty, but the outside at the windows were a lot of people looking into the church and crossing themselves. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but no, the, the, the Catholic church at that time was, um, how shall I put it? Segregation was not uncommon. Yes, you could buy pews in those days. And um, I can remember one of his friends, tall, very stately woman. And um, somebody was in their pew up in Bay Street at the, the um, church there, and um, she just stood up. The person had to be removed by Sexton. And I know these things because when Montessori first came to Barbados, it was at the Ursuline Convent. And um, my father was excited about it. Oh, it was something new and wonderful. He'd read up everything about it. And I was enrolled there. My cousin, Ann Coles, and I, oh, dear, 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 big blue bonnet. <laughs> and outside was a statue, about as tall as I am now, of Our Lady. But we were in Montessori learning this new methodology and so on. My father would come and he'd pick up, because he only had half days, only half day school. And um, my father would come and he'd pick up to pick me up. And I stood up in the same place waiting for him. I didn't particularly notice that statue of a lady was next to me. And when he saw that, I didn't even last a term. At, Montes at that Montessori. He said, no, I'm not having you worship, worshiping, um, you know. I didn't even know the difference. But um, it was a good school and there were lots of young women in particular, because um, it really was a girls' school. Um, came from Venezuela and other uh, countries to learn to speak English. It was beautiful. There was a lovely chapel there. There was a piano. Uh, my cousin Betsy Coos, she used to play the piano, and Jeanette, her sister. So then I went off to but the first school I ever went to was to be in Warm Lodge. And when we got there, so much disappointment, because I was now in between my father and the, you know, and pick up, and excitement, you know, I'm going to school. Got bag and everything. And when we got there, the lady who ran the school apparently was very ill, and there was not going to be any school, and they didn't know how long there was going to be school. So apparently my mother said to my father, well, we just have to take her back home. He says, no, we are going to find a school. We've been telling her she's going to school and she's all dressed and ready and got her lunch to go to school. We have to find a school. So he then drove slowly back up Black Rock now looking for a school. And Harold Hoyt's mom, she had a school in Washington Avenue. Just a little square wooden house, but beautiful. And so I can remember my father driving up and he got out, she came out. She was a lovely woman. His father was a great man too, I, I, I liked his parents. 
because he used to do, he, he, he opened a, or an agency for people traveling, a travel agency, yeah. And I used to, I used to patronize him all the time. But Mrs. Hoyt came out and Daddy explained, he said, you know, she has to go to school. If not, she'll be in tears. And um, she said, all right, you leave her with me. And she took me inside that school. And guess who she put me to sit next to? Harold. In much later years, if Harold and I were at, you know, well, I mustn't overstate it. But if we couldn't see eye to eye on our shoes and just have arguments and so on, you know, I would remind him all the time. You know, your mother put me to sit next to you when I first went into her school. <laughs> and now you are disagreeing with me and quarreling with me all the time. You know, it was like that. But then um, he found a school that he thought was really good, a woman called Minnie Rabbit. She used to be a headmistress at one of the, I cannot remember which one it was, one of the government um, primary schools and she was a great teacher she was a great teacher when she died all of the boys all of my brothers um, oh dear I gotta remember these boys the headmaster of St. Leonard's school because it was when St. Leonard's school was being s built I was going to school at Miss Rabbit and um, all of the boys, uh, what was his name? Tall, distinguished gentleman was the headmaster then. Uh, it was then St. Leonard's, and then it became um, what it is now. Um, what, is, what was his name? Two of the boys went to Harrison College with my brothers, I can't even remember. Guy Griffith and his brother. And the undertaker was Charlie, oh dear, his father was the undertaker, anyhow. They told the family, we will lift her. And all of the boys, including my two eldest brothers, they all lifted her to her grave. She was a fantastic teacher. And so caring, you know? If you had a little scratch that you got, she wouldn't quarrel with you about it. She would go upstairs and get him a cure chrome, you know, and of course, it was like a badge of honor. There are so many things that we could learn from the lives of those who reached out and touched the lives of others. As Dame Billy Miller recalls her experiences, it is certainly hope that the fine examples of the men and women who went before us would serve to inspire Barbados. The series continues next week, I'm Sherwood McCaskey.